I was going to ask you about the neuroscience starting points. I'm very glad you're starting with that right away. Well, I wanted to um, wanted to make this a little bit different, um, and so the the goal was to 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 share with you all some findings regarding the effects of um, socioeconomic status of individuals on how they form expectations about the economy. And, uh, and I'm gonna tell you about that. Uh, I'm gonna start first by telling you a little bit about the brain and, and how it, it deals with information, especially um, in situations of adversity. And we're gonna build on some findings from neuroscience. We're gonna, we're gonna run some experiments, uh, standard experiments in finance. And then I'm gonna show you some large survey evidence um, all just to illustrate the effect that somebody's socioeconomic status has on how they, um, again, how they form beliefs about the economy. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna be going here. I have 30 minutes. Um, and I, like I promised, I will start from um, some neuroscience insights about how people form beliefs. Um, the first insight is that there's an asymmetry in the brain uh, regarding the processing of gain and loss information. This is something that I, um, together with a neuroscientist co-authored, we investigated many years ago. Um, and basically we were able to, to really show that in the brain, when you deal with information which is negative, uh, it's sort of counterfactual in a negative way relative to what you're expecting. You engage a certain part of the brain. If the information is positive, then you engage a different part of your brain. And um, this indicated that perhaps the way you update from information depends on the domain of the updating. Are you updating in the negative or the positive domain? Uh, and I, I pursued this idea in a, in a um, paper in the JF a few years back. And indeed there I showed through a, a standard finance experiment, a laboratory experiment that uh, learning is different across these two domains. And in particular, when people are learning in the lost domain, so they're learning in a situation resembling very much a recession, right? Bad news everywhere. Um, then they become um, overly pessimistic. Uh, in, in that particular situation, it turns out that one extra bit of bad news really has a very heavy weight on in how people update and it makes these individuals become overly pessimistic. And the implication of this is that um, you might have recessions be uh, longer and more severe than they should be just because of this um, uh, issue with updating in the negative domain relative to updating from in a positive domain, let's say in situations of, of booms. So uh, very briefly about that experiment, basically people there had to learn about whether or not they're faced with, a, with a, an asset paying from a good or a bad distribution. If, if it was paying from a good distribution, it tended to pay a high dividend more often than um, paying a low dividend. Um, if it was paying from a bad distribution, the low dividend would be the one most likely to show up. Now, they could learn about whether or not they're faced with a good or a bad asset uh, in a recession-like environment where the payoff of the asset was negative, uh, either the high or the low dividend were going to be negative numbers, or they could learn in a, in a situation which is like a boom where both possible payoffs of the asset were positive. So in either of these situations, in a boom and a recession, of course, you, you could face an asset which is better than another. So the question is, can people objectively assess the probability that they're faced with a better of the two assets? And can they do so equally well when they're learning in a boom-like situation or a session-like situation? And what we find is shown here, if you look on the left side of your screen, uh, uh, this is, this is what, these are results in situations when people are um, actively also investing in these assets. So they had their own money at stake. Um, we also ran an experiment where people were just learning about these assets just and passively learning without having their own money at stake. So what we find in, in either of these situations, but, but uh, clearly more strongly in the active um, version of the experiment, when you're actively, again, investing and, and, and experiencing the consequences of your choices in these, in, these asset, uh, in these investments, is that in the large domain, which is here indicated by data points with, uh, on the red dashed line, in the large domain, people's um, beliefs, expectations about whether or not they're faced with the better and not the worst of the two possible assets, they're, um, those ex expectations are, are too pessimistic. So there's an objective probability, which is what we have here on the x-axis, that given the dividends you're observing from this asset, that this asset is the better one. It's the one that tends to pay the high dividends with higher probability. And then we look at subjective beliefs about this. What is the subjective probability of the participants in the experiment that indeed they're faced with the asset that's, that's paying from the better distribution? 
And again, as you, what you see here is that if you look at the red versus the black uh, black line is that people don't, um, don't form beliefs on the same matter and they gain the lost domain. Uh, in, in the lost domain, again, they are too pessimistic relative to the, to the gain domain, domain when they're assessing the probability that they're dealing with the better of the two possible assets. Um, and we replicate this, uh, this pessimism bias, if you wish, in, uh, in the US sample, which is where this data is coming from. We also see it in the Romanian sample. Um, there's this big wedge. Uh, if you look between the black and the red line, again, we're indicating that relative to objectively what these people should assess is, you know, what's the chance that I'm faced with the better of the two possible assets? In the large domain, people are overly pessimistic. They assess um, too low of a chance relative to what they would say in the gain domain, that is in situations when um, they're learning from positive payoffs. And recall that in both in, in situations when everything is paying positive payoffs, as well as in situations where everything is paying just negative payoffs, there's always a better of two possible assets. So the, the learning question that people have to answer is exactly the same, whether they're learning about assets that all pay positive payoffs or they're learning about assets that all pay negative payoffs. And then we replicated this, this effect also in, in Germany with a bunch of um, German investors, and you see the same wedge there, not to the same extent as in the Romanian sample or the American sample. The Germans are actually the, the best, if you look at the wedge that they have in terms of learning in the, in the negative versus the positive domain, but they still have this wedge. That is, when people are learning in a situation where they're, they're just observing negative payoffs all over the place, uh, their learning is, is biased, they, they become overly pessimistic. So what this says, um, and again, this is the, we observe this because um, in the data, we see that people react very strongly to one additional low outcome in the negative domain. So if you're in a recession and you get one more little bit of bad news, you, all, you, you react to that uh, quite a lot and it makes you, your overall expectations too pessimistic. And so what we see in that experiment is that people who are um, uh, learning in the, in the negative domain, they actually end up being uh, uh, avoiding risky assets. Uh, even though they, they should not. Um, and uh, we're sort of, we're gonna build on this, on this result in the next couple of studies. Um, basically what we learn from here is that in the laboratory, we can, we can induce this pessimism bias by having people be surrounded by a bunch of negative information. Uh, and then we're thinking, look, if somebody has been seeing this type of negative information their entire life, if they've faced a lot of adversity, if there's somebody coming from a situation of, of low social economic status, then this is going to make these individuals become overly pessimistic about uh, anything they see out there, payoffs of financial assets, the macroeconomy, and other things like that. And, uh, and we, uh, another reason to, to expect that this was going to happen is because in neuroscience, we have, an, um, we have a bunch of findings that indicate that if you've seen a bunch of adversity, especially early in your life, then this biases the way the brain deals with new information about uh, rewards and punishments. In particular, if you have uh, a bunch of adversity in your life so far, then you have an increased sensitivity to loss information and a decreased sensitivity to gain information. It's as if your brain ignores um, information about good things happening out there and it overreacts to, to information about, or to bad information that you, that you receive in the environment. So again, this would suggest that if you're coming from a low socioeconomic status background, then you're going to have this, this pessimistic lens on, on the world. You're going to, um, um, to basically see things as being worse than they, they really have to be, um, or they really are. So what this means, if this is true, if we observe this pessimism in the data uh, among lower socioeconomic status individuals, is that because of their overly pessimistic beliefs about how good things truly are out there, um, these people are going to basically not invest, let's say, in financial assets. They might not invest in new businesses. Uh, and, 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 and in a sense, these expectations are going to keep them down. Thank you. Um, so let's see what we find. Um, in, this is a data from a study ran in Romania again, uh, where we can basically with, a, with very uh, small amounts of money, we can incentivize people to do well in experiments. Um, and there, what we find is that uh, people, uh, these are young adults. Um, so we're looking at, at 
college students, some of them grew up in, in poverty, some of them grew up in, in kind of a, a middle class or, or even rich families back there, but they're all going to the same really good university. It's, it's, a, it's a top public university in Romania. They, uh, the government basically pays for everybody to go there. So, so your financial needs don't, don't keep you away from attending that school. If you're smart, you, you, you go there. So controlling for these people's intellectual ability, if you wish, what we find is that when they're in the experiment, they're trying to learn about the quality of an investment asset presented to them. Is this asset of the good type or the bad type? Is this, is this the, the asset that tends to pay high dividends or low dividends? Uh, we see that uh, these people who are coming from, from, from poverty, if you wish, from low, low socioeconomic status backgrounds um, are going to end up with uh, more pessimistic beliefs about the quality of that investment assets relative to people who are coming from higher uh, income uh, environments. And again, this is providing everybody with the same information about the assets. So objectively, they say the same thing, the same stream of dividends. And yet the lower SES individuals, which is what you see in this picture through the red line, always uh, provide a, a more pessimistic estimate of, of the probability that they're facing, they're faced with a, with a good asset, the one that's paying from better distribution compared from, to the mid and high SES individuals. Um, now, you might say this is just Romania. This is a um, uh, uh, some weird sample. Um, does this hold in, 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 in reality? And I should say one more thing here is that the, these people who are coming from low SES environment, we see for more pessimistic beliefs about the quality of the investment available to them. These are the same people who actually invest less in this asset, especially when objectively the, the asset is, is, should be invested in. It, it's basically the best option for these people. So these, these pessimistic expectations are holding these low SES individuals back from making an investment when the expected return is, is, um, is, is high. So again, do we see a replication of this in, in, um, in a data set that you might believe more? Um, maybe this is just a weird Romanian sample. Um, the answer is yes, we can replicate. And this is a paper with um, Shiroshi Das and Stefan Nagel, um, where we use data from the Michigan Survey of Consumers. Um, and uh, that covers uh, almost four decades worth of data. Uh, these are, we have many, many individuals across uh, uh, the majority of counties in the United States. Um, and the question is, if you're using this data set that goes back in time for you know, almost four decades, do you observe that households that are coming from a low SES environment, those households who are lower income, lower education, who've you know, experienced things like unemployment, things like that, do you see those households when they're, when they're asked to consider the macroeconomy, do you see them forming beliefs about the macroeconomy, which, is, which are more pessimistic than the beliefs formed by people coming from higher SES backgrounds, from higher income uh, backgrounds, for example. Um, and this is exactly what we find. And furthermore, it turns out that we can, we can show that uh, there is a clear effect of these expectations that people have about the macroeconomy, how things are going in the country. Uh, um, so there's an effect of these beliefs on what these people plan on doing in terms of buying homes, buying durable goods, buying cars. So if you see, for example, that an individual that's coming from a low income situation, uh, if they say to you, no, it's, this is not a good time to buy a home, which is what you tend to see in the data, lower SES people are not as inclined to buy homes that higher, than higher SES people, uh, a large part of that effect actually is coming from the fact that the lower SES individual is more pessimistic about the macroeconomy. So, so expectations that people form about how good things are out there in terms of financial investments or about unemployment and other business conditions, those expectations matter. They, they drive people's actions and they can explain, you know, anywhere between, you know, eight and 30% roughly, depending on how you look at it, um, of the effect of, of a person's social economic status on what choices they make. So let me show you some results from this, um, uh, from this study. What I have here is a, uh, I have two, two times here just to keep things simple. If you look at the black line in the graph, um, it shows you what is the average optimism about macroeconomic conditions of people who at the point in time when these beliefs are measured happen to be in the top income quintile. 
uh, and this is controlling for age. So for that, but for a, any age group, we put people in, in income quintiles and we do so at every point in time in, in this sample that's almost 40 years long. Um, and then we, we also plot in the red dashed line, the optimism about the macroeconomy of people who are in the bottom income quintile at that point, and again, controlling for this individual's age, uh, age group. Um, the optimism index uh, that is plotted on the y-axis is a, um, uh, it, it's a, it's usually it's an average of how optimistic people are when they have to think about several macroeconomic conditions. So one of them is um, based on the question, what do you think is going to happen to unemployment in the next year? Will unemployment be higher, the same or lower than now? Another question is, uh, what do you think is going to happen to general business conditions in the country? Uh, in the next 12 months, will they be better, the same or worse? And, and there, are, there, are about, there are about five of these. Um, so we can quantify how optimistic people are for each one of these dimensions, and then we average their optimism to get this optimism index that you see plotted on the y-axis. And uh, the, the final thing that you can see in this picture before I interpret the result are these uh, uh, shaded gray, gray um, areas. Hopefully you can see them, and they indicate to you when uh, recessions were going on during this time period from the, the, the late 70s to a um, few years ago. So what you, what you see very clearly here is that uh, for this very long time period, it's clear that individuals who are earning more, people who are in the top income quintile, are more optimistic about the future of the economy. That is what's gonna happen to the American economy in the next 12 months relative to people who are in the bottom income quintile. And this is not just a top quintile versus a bottom quintile effect. The, if you were to plot all of the expectations of people across the five different quintiles, you'll see a very clear gradation exactly what you'd expect. So the people who are making the most money are most optimistic. The people who are making the you know, less money are gonna be less optimistic. So absolutely the, what we see in, in, in this graph here matches what we saw earlier in the experiments. That is people coming or experiencing um, uh, low socioeconomic status, status or more adversity, if you wish, which here is characterized by, by having lower incomes, these individuals are going to form more pessimistic beliefs about the macroeconomy. That's why this red line is below the, the black line, which are the beliefs of the higher income people. Now, the other thing that you see here is that this wedge between the uh, economic optimism of people who are in the top versus the bottom quintile, that wedge, uh, is lower dramatically in recessions. So if you look at the last recession here, well, before coronavirus, um, you see that these, the black and the red lines pretty much meet. So in recessions, uh, the optimism of the people at the top of the income distribution uh, temporarily gets reduced. And after that, very quickly it bounces back up. So this, this wedge and expectations about the macroeconomy that we see based on income, uh, the income of the households, this wedge again is reduced in recessions, but outside of these recession times, it's, it's very, very clearly there. So again, to summarize, people coming from low socioeconomic status backgrounds um, are going to be, for whatever reason, they're gonna be uh, more pessimistic about the economy and relative people from higher income uh, situations. And the same is a uh, result is seen if you split people by education. So um, I'm showing you guys the average optimism about the macroeconomy of people who have a college degree. This is the black line and people who do not have a college degree. This is the dashed red line. And you can see this picture is very clear. The black line is always above the red line with the exception of recessions. So in recessions, again, the optimism of the people with a college degree of those with high education drops temporarily and then it bounces back again. Um, so when you look at these pictures, uh, um, an interesting question that should come to mind um, is, you know, why is this happening? What is exactly the, the psychological mechanism at play here? And in, in the paper, uh, my co-authors and I were, were thinking about several mechanisms um, and it's, it, it, the one that seems to be most supported by the data is one where if you're coming from a low socioeconomic status environment, um, it seems as if you don't believe the, the public signals about the economy. You don't, you don't really update. That's what's going on here. The, basically, the people in the lower income uh, um, swaths of, uh, of the population or low education, these individuals, their, their expectations do not vary with objective developments in the, in the macroeconomy as much as those of the higher income individuals. So it's as if these 
these lower expect the lower income or, or education individuals don't update as much and in particular they don't tend to update from a public signal and that's something that we, we spend some time in the paper but it's it's not clearly um, um, we, we haven't you know fully determined exactly the psychological mechanism you know is it that they the lower income people do they ignore certain kinds of public signals only in certain types of economic conditions this is this is something that I think is really worth pursuing if you were if you believe that that um, in the cross-section of households, there are differences in how people learn. Uh, I, I think we need models that, that really dig into this. Um, so uh, let me show you a few more results from this paper. Um, this was, this is, uh, these are expectations uh, that people produce that are with respect to um, the return of the stock market. In particular, people are asked, what is the probability that over the next 12 months, the uh, US stock market is going to have a positive return. And as you can see here, the people in the top income quintile are way more optimistic about that than the people in the bottom income quintile. There's a gap here between the probability that on average, high income people assigned to the stock market basically being a good place to put your money and the probability that, that lower income people assigned to this same thing, there's a, there's a gap of about 25% on average. So if you're asking yourselves, why is it that we don't see a lot of lower income individuals investing anything in the stock market? In part, this is coming because these lower income individuals are way more pessimistic about the whether or not returns in the stock market are, are positive. Um, and in the paper, we did some calculations for that. And again, you can you can you, you absolutely see in the data because we, we measure these people's um, exposure to, to equity markets too. You see definitely that people coming from low lower income situations or as you can see here, people who are coming from uh, uh, low education backgrounds, people without a college degree, for example, these people invest less in equities and, and about 30% of that effect is coming through beliefs. It's coming from the fact that lower income or lower education individuals uh, form these really pessimistic expectations about uh, the probability the stock market in the next year will have a positive return. So again, beliefs matter. Beliefs matter for what people do. Um, and then um, the building on this idea that that if you're coming from from um, an adverse situation, you know you have lower income, lower education, um, that this changes the way you think about the the world. Um, I, I wrote another paper with a, with a set of, of uh, co-authors recently where we're investigating whether or not uh, the degree to which you've experienced adversity, it also changes um, the second moment of, of beliefs, if you want. So, so far in the, in the projects that I described, we were trying to assess people's optimism. Basically, that's the first moment of expectations. What is, you know, think about the stock market return what do you think is going to be the return? Give me a guess. Come up with an expected value for that return. Or tell me what do you think will happen to unemployment? Give me a, a you know some kind of a point estimate for what's going to happen to unemployment down the road. So what I what we've seen so far is that people with more adversity in their in their lives tend to to come up with these more pessimistic point estimates about macroeconomic conditions. But another thing that could be going could be going on is that adversity that you've experienced in the past. Um, makes you also be more uncertain in your in your forecast and why is that uh, this is coming from a bunch of psychology studies and neuroscience studies um, that have demonstrated that indeed life adversity and, and in environmental instability in your home they influence how they learn uh, how people learn about outside things so if you come from an environment where maybe you know your parents um, lost their jobs, unemployment has been an issue, or income has been very, very volatile and, and really low over time. Those types of individuals basically project that the whole world is unstable. The whole world is very uncertain. And this is, this is again coming from studies of, from psychology that are mainly focused on, sport, on, on children and young adults. And so if you believe those studies, then the implication would be Again, people who are now adults and they, they have their own financial situation, um, these individuals, if they're if they've been faced with uncertain with, with a lot of adversity, uh, they will tend to be uncertain about economic forecasts, about what's possible out there, about where the economy is going. Um, 
at, at the macro level, but also in terms of their own personal situation. And so, and that's what we, um, that's what we find in the paper with Elias Fermand and um, Yang Li and Zahib and David. Um, it's exactly this. So we can show in the cross-section of households that those households coming from lower SES, lower socioeconomic status situations, people that these are individuals with lower income, lower education, living in counties with higher unemployment, for example, those people, when they form beliefs about what's going to happen to say things like inflation, at the macroeconomy or home prices at the national level, or their own income, for example, when they're coming up with these projections, they are uncertain in the projections. They come up with distribution of, of possible outcomes that are quite wide. Um, and the, this matters, turns out. In the data that we're gonna use here, which is coming from the New York Fed, we also observe these people's uh, choices or at least the, the choices that they declare in, in a survey. We don't have administrative data on this particular data set. And it turns out that all of SQL, uh, if you control for people's you know, income or wealth, or if you control for the first moment of their beliefs. So again, all of SQL, what you see is that people who are more uncertain when they're, for, or when they're forecasting things like what inflation is gonna look like or, or home prices, what they're gonna do at the national level, if people are, are, are more uncertain in these forecasts they're making, then they're going to behave in a precautionary manner in terms of how much they plan to spend to consume in the next year, uh, in terms of how they plan on, on, on using credit markets, uh, in terms of how exposed they, they are to equity markets. So uncertainty matters for choices in a way that's actually quite consistent with uh, standard models that we have in economics and finance uh, that link, in fact, uncertainty about some future economic variable that could impact your, your wealth down the road with your actions today. So, so in this paper, again, what we're doing is a couple of things. We're, we're demonstrating that we can predict which household is going to be more uncertain about in their economic forecasts. Uh, and then we can show that this uncertainty matters for choices, at least choices declared in, in the survey. Um, and like I was saying here, we use data from the New York, uh, New York Fed. This is the survey of, of consumer expectations. Um, it has more than a thousand people per month. These guys are actually followed over time for about a year. This is different relative to the Michigan uh, survey of consumers where uh, people only show up in that panel up to two times and only just a small fraction of the respondents do. Um, so uh, here we can actually track these people over time and we can see how they change their forecasts about various economic conditions. And one good reason why you want to you want to see people show up in a, you know, be in a panel and, and so have repeated observations is because it allows you to assess uh, some basic things about their updating. So, you know, do you see that, you know, some base, some properties of, 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 of uh, Bayesian learning, do they apply here? Do people seem to be somewhat reasonable? So for example, if, you know, I have a very uncertain prior about something about inflation, um, when you ask me about this thing again later on, uh, do I have a bigger jump in my forecast, again, because my prior was uncertain. That's kind of what it should be from, from, the, from the theory. And so when you have repeated observations for, for respondents, you can check these very basic aspects of, of learning. Um, so again, what we find here is that uh, when you ask people to come up with distributions for things like inflation in the economy, home prices nationwide, as well as their own income, individuals who have lower income and education levels, those who live in counties with higher employment, those who have more precarious financial conditions, meaning these are people who say that there's a higher probability that they can't meet their, um, they cannot pay their debt or bills in the near future. These are the people who are going to have very um, broad uh, distributions when they come up with these, with these projections for, for these macro as well as microeconomic variables. Um, and you can see this, their uncertainty that is how, how which is, if you want, is a standard deviation of, of distributions that they produce for things like inflation or own income growth or on prices, this uncertainty drops with income, um, whether, again, you're looking at an uncertainty about own income growth, inflation, or home prices. Um, and also, I, I, didn't, I don't have enough, all the slides here, but it also drops with education. It's, we show this in all, in all kinds of regressions. Uncertainty, basically, is the highest in people who have low income, low education, and live in precarious situations. Um, and interestingly, if you are uncertain about one thing, if you, let's say you are, you're uncertain about home prices, 
in, in, in the economy, you also tend to be uncertain about inflation as well as your own income growth. So there is a permeation, if you want, of, of people's uncertainty in uh, respect with respect to one economic forecast to their uncertainty about some other economic variable. Uh, if, if you want, there's, there's, it's sort of like a personal characteristic of the individual. If they're uncertain about one thing, they're going to be uncertain about pretty much everything. And that's interesting because there's no reason to, to have this happen. You know, in your mathematical models where people have to think about buying a home, the uncertainty they have about home prices, you know, that doesn't have to be related to uncertainty they have about their own income. And yet in the data, um, there is such a correlation. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is that uh, sort of to end it on a, on a good note, uh, not everybody responds to adversity, to, to being in a difficult situation the same way. Um, it turns out that, again, from neuroscience, that there is this uh, characteristic of individuals that's called self-efficacy. Uh, self-efficacy helps you deal with negative shocks. Somebody who scores high on self-efficacy is an individual who believes uh, with a lot of um, uh, 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 conviction that their actions can change the future. So if I have high self-efficacy, it means that my, I believe that my actions will change the future. Therefore, it makes sense for me to engage and put some effort in because this way I can make the future brighter. Um, and so what we, we, we built on this idea, and this is a paper with Brian Meltzer um, from a, a couple of years ago, and we looked to see whether or not uh, people who have high self-efficacy measured early in life if these individuals are able, better able to cope with negative shocks, and as a result of that, they'll end up with a better financial situation. And in the data set that we have, we have a lot of information about their uh, delinquency rates on, you know, in terms of paying debts, in terms of paying bills. And what you see is, uh, and by the way, the data comes from the um, National Institute Survey uh, of Youth, um, the Child and Young Adult Sample, the NLSY, which is a famous data set used for many other purposes. Um, and we track uh, thousands of individuals over time. We have data about them from when they were kids, but also we have data about their delinquency, financial delinquency now when they're adults in their 20s and 30s. Um, and we find that individuals who have higher self-efficacy, which is measured by this thing called the Perlin score, are going to have way lower uh, rates of financial delinquency in terms of paying bills or paying debt compared to people who have low scores on the self-efficacy. And the interesting thing is that, again, this holds for Controlling for people's education, for cognitive ability, we have a lot of measures about these people's cognition, if you wish, from when they're younger. Um, it holds within, within family with mother fixed effects. So we can compare two siblings from the same family. And it, it's, we see that the sibling with higher self-efficacy ends up being better off. They, can, they end up avoiding delinquency. Um, and the, the part that I really uh, I find very interesting is that the effects that we document here are, are significantly larger for people who, who um, come from very low wealth families. So people who have the poorest mothers, among those individuals, you see that self-efficacy really helps them avoid delinquency. So there's the self-efficacy is, if you wish, it's a non-cognitive ability of an individual. And it's very important to have it if you do not have basically intrafamily insurance. If you have no other means so that you avoid the fall down the road, it's really good for you to have this non-cognitive skill. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here. I don't want to keep you guys too late um, by saying that, you know, when you're thinking about household finance studies, it's, it, it may be useful for you to learn from another discipline. I, I built in my papers a lot on knowing from things about neuroscience, how the brain works, but there are many other um, disciplines that you can learn from. I think it's by working in, in this interdisciplinary fashion, you can come up with interesting research questions that you wouldn't be able to come up with otherwise. Thank you.